on. There we go. Hello. And there's our clickety clack, clickety clack typewriters. And one of these days, I'll upgrade it to where I can do sounds to go along with this. Can people remember what typewriters and dial telephones and alarm clocks sounded like? My, my, my. And there, Troubles in Paradise, the Methodology of Creationism, tortukan.wordpress.com, my obligatory warning that if you don't have this on your website linkages and your safe things, why not? Because that's what I'm doing all of this for, so we can connect up and bring all information. So we will stop our sharing, and I can close that little puppy down, and proceed with the happy show, which is uh, continuing the discussion Jim. of... Um, Jim. Yes. Ah. Uh -huh. What? What's enough? I'm attempting to start the show. Anyway, uh, Contested Bones, which is the book by Rupi and Sanford, that is the uh, first core of our discussion uh, that relates to um, uh, the creationist getting, argument. Jim, we're getting you. Hmm? We're getting you back here. What? Let me. Oh, I have an idea. I may have an explanation as to why that is. Maybe I forgot to turn something off here. Let me see. What happened? Uh, oh, yeah, that's points. because I, I got. My, I'm not muting my uh, background feed. My bad. Oh, I can't. Is it hear gone anything. now? I couldn't hear it. I couldn't it hear it either. Okay, it should be okay now. I I had I didn't have my uh, mute on, so I was probably getting a little feedback from some of your eggs. Or it could be demons in the case of Crocus Squirrel. Uh, there's there's demons I think over on the east side I'm of the state hearing, of Washington. I'm still hearing you oh. and you. Oh well, uh, I I've muted at my end, so it <laughs> Are, it isn't do you me. Have it up by chance, squirrel. Yeah, squirrel. None of us can hear him except you. Yeah. It's your problem. Anyway, I will. No, while, I while Crocker Squirrel resolves that problem. Um, oh, right, I see right, a, right, a, right. a BJ is in the uh, screen. Hello, BJ. Size Strike's there. Uh, you can come in too, Size Strike. You're welcome. Old Scratch. Join us. I sent you a link. Yes, <laughs> more the merrier because there's a lot of stupid to discuss. Uh, One anyway. One of us. One yeah. of us. <laughs> uh, us. Bring on the pug. Anyway, uh, that uh, Rupi and Sanford, are, uh, for you who have been following those, you will know that uh, Rupi and Sanford's position is that Homo erectus and uh, Homo floresiensis, uh, um, the hobbit, are all just normal people and Neanderthals. They're just weird, deformed, normal people who uh, all popped along apparently after the fall of Adam or the flood or somewhere or other. They're still kind of vague <laughs> about the details. And um, uh, so they engage in a colossal pigeonhole uh, to try to flunk everything along. And it's clearly the case, although that creation is C. Brown, who haunts uh, the, the feed, if you follow the comments uh, sections, uh, doesn't want to agree on that. I contend that Rupi and Sanford, or rather Rupi, who's the point person here, uh, is effectively cherry picking uh, material to reinforce the argument that he wants to be true, which is that uh, the brains of uh, Florenziensis are just perfectly within the human range and the skeletal relationships and the bone structures and uh, then they're, they're tool makers and this is the episode that we're dealing with here because the supposedly they made advanced tools. Uh, I put an article up that Rupi uh, that you can look for yourself at the advanced tools uh, that are uh, in the frame. And the problem is, and here's where they were cherry picking, because you'll be able to see that from Kate Wong's article and uh, the others up, is that they found additional tools. And the other issue is when these date to, there's indication that this little Homo floresiensis has been there for hundreds of thousands of years. They go back to 800,000 or more on some of the dates. And this is still where some of the controversies are to get the data field straightened out. But um, so these other tools that were found, including things that relate to spear points and others that are a little more sophisticated, uh, they're not sure whether those are from this Floresiensis, uh, Floresiensis uh, critter or humans that had arrived there. And so uh, the, the Wong makes a particular point that there are paleoanthropologists that are very skeptical that these things are associated with the Hobbit. And conveniently enough, Rupert never Rupi never quotes any of that. <laughs> well, so he has to constantly step. 
there's one really yeah. good way to tell whether or not somebody what somebody was intended to use a specific tool. You t you look at the tool, and you look at the size, the hand, the credit that you expect was using it, and if the and, and if the tool is too big or much too small, then somebody else used it. <laughs> yeah, that would be that's difficult to resolve here yet because there are no really full body skeletons. Hello, size strike. Hey, the pug. Hello all. Thank you. Greetings, pug. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have a wonderful range of stupid uh, today, uh, and we'll want to be covering all of that. So anyway, <laughs> at the moment, I'm dealing with Rupi and Sanford stupid. And the, the thing that is so consistent about Rupi's air quote scholarship is how selected he is. And he is trawling through a variety of materials, sometimes very old a material that's been superseded. All of the older authority quotes on The Hobbit that predate 2009 are largely irrelevant because they found additional specimens. And so that has to be taken into account. But I put up the articles on, on the, uh, the Wong elements and everything with their, I think they're mainly PDFs that everyone can look up on their own. And I strongly recommend people do. In fact, the whole series that I put up, it's fun because you learn shit. <laughs> when you read the original material, you find out what not only was under the eyeballs of the creationists, but you find all the information that was under their eyeballs that they somehow managed to miss. And or the ignore. other, the, so. yeah, or ignore. And another, another pop that they're trying to argue in the story is that um, the Hobbit made boats because the only way they could get to Flores would be by making boats because the distance is minimum 19 kilometers. And they quote somebody on that, even at the, the height of the ice age. When you look at the topographical maps, and I made a point of doing that, uh, there's a big drop off at the Sunda Strait where it, the, this thing suddenly goes to like 200 meters depth all of a sudden, and that's the area that the Flores Island is on. And so even when the sea level dropped by 100 meters, nonetheless, it's still not enough to eliminate the little sea brunt. So you still got like 19 kilometers minimum, although they're mountainous areas. So first of all, when you, you can see a long way from a hill. And so the, the possibility that nobody on the one side of the uh, uh, thing that's, that was a continuous mainland all the way up into Asia when the ice age was lower, couldn't see across the little body of water that 19 kilometers to realize, hey, there's land on that side. But um, the, several of the sources that Rupi actually cited and never quoted explicitly pointed out that animals can be swept and people can be swept by tidal waves and accidentally in a variety of ways. They, they can all, a family of people can be on a, um, uh, in, a in a mass of trees and whoop, uh, uh, brought all together in one fell swoop. And this happens in tsunamis and that all the time. And so that there are, um, a, 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 the argument that one of the sources, the Seddon book from 2012 argued, is that the evidence persuades them that the most likely thing is that there was an accidental sweeping it's remember it's very volcanic area i mean they got active volcanoes they have tidal waves you know indonesia has more volcanoes than anywhere <laughs> active and it's been this way for mill millions of years so well, all of this is not terrible even worse is at the time we're talking about large chunks of land could be either scraped away or ejected because we don't have a, well nobody i'm, I'm no, not sure no, we have no, a clear no, view of fair, where exactly to say that where it's exactly fair to say that no human being is going to be ejected by a volcano uh, across the Flores. Well, I'm not uh, the thing is, is that what I was talking about. I was talking about the landmass they were living on, potentially even Flores Island, having been moved. Um, it's not the, geolo the geologists are pretty clear that that over the relatively short time frame that we're talking about, that they, they can measure out what the situation was. That's why it's such a fascinating puzzle. Because even when you take into account the lowered sea level during the ice age, uh, when they would have been coming across, you still have this one 19 kilometer gap from the mainland across. Uh, but the thing is, is that the, I don't necessarily rule out that they could figure out how to use um, uh, logs as and, and paddle that way. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily rule that out even as well, but the, but the, the, the ones that most of the people were fa favoring in the scientific community is that this was an accidental dispersion, which does happen. In fact, they argue that's how monkeys made it to uh, the new world uh, is through accidental dispersion. I remember Casey Luskin 
uh, late of the Discovery Institute would just be um, uh, going off on that. We get some questions in their old scratch. Would rafts be too difficult for them? This is the interesting debate because it involves uh, ewing wood. It involves um, uh, making um, uh, strapping and, and attaching them together on this. Um, we, we're, we're changing a lot of our views to some extent, certainly regarding human dispersal, because uh, it's nobody doubts that there was a way longer gap to get to Australia, and that was with purely humans about 60,000 years ago. And there's no way they're going to get across there without some kind of, of raft or canoe or something. But remember, human beings and presumably even Homo erectus, Homo erectus and their kin spread all over the world of, um, except for the New World. They didn't manage to make it to the New World, but they, they spread out of Africa in multiple waves that we're now piecing together more and more in the technical literature and diversified to make Neanderthals up in uh, Europe and Eurasia. And then, of course, Asian, all, 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 um, the uh, what used to be called Peking Man and Java Man and all that Java Man just north of where Flores is. Um, they, they got around. And this we're talking over a million, two million years earlier. So there was a huge spread of these wanderlust bipedal primates that were making primitive tools uh, that are about on the same ballpark frame as what we're seeing in Homo floresiensis. So it's a fascinating phenomenon to see how diminutive can you get. Uh, the brains uh, suggest that they've got some interesting convolutions, but independent of, of whether they were stupid or clever for their period, and I'm perfectly happy to have them being very clever, it's that they're not humans. There is enough anatomically different between their physical anatomy now that we have more skulls available, and this was the stuff that I alluded to in the earlier um, uh, videos, is that it really isn't working well to argue that there's some mutant version of Homo sapiens, that they're too far removed, they're in the Homo erectus clade, not Homo sapiens. And um, Rupi and company just bypassed that information right and left, source after source after source, uh, particularly the cladistic studies. Uh, these are, are, uh, are terribly relevant. Uh, so any, any comments from my peanut gallery that I have in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's, I, I've been, I've been kind of looking into Flores in the last little, in the last, in the last little while, and I'm not seeing anything major. There's entirely, there are lots of different ways that people kind of got right out. Uh, yeah. Beachcombing was one of the bigger ones, uh, at least as yeah, far it, as I can it, tell. But uh, it's, it's entirely possible we got we got we got we got small groups or small populations that got that wound up sitting on chunks of like wooden brush yeah. that wound up floating across 19 kilometers. We 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 can see something we can see something like that happening right now. Uh, in fact, if you really want to, if you really want to be silly, there's a whole pile of just shit and garbage running around the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's just there. It's been there for it's been there for years. No, it's been there for decades. It's getting oh, bigger. Yeah, they, at this this, point, but this you, relates to how um, uh, debris patterns when ships break up, uh, where they can track how the current systems run and all of that. And uh -huh. uh, the dispersal issue of how, how animals get to isolated environments is one of the fascinating biogeographical issues of all science and and from an evolutionary point of view nothing happens by magic so if they got there they had to have come there by natural means now theoretically the creationists could theoretically argue that god after making adam and eve decided to make uh, a homo floresiensis in uh, floresiensis in in situ but they don't have that they have their own set of bottlenecks so they've got to figure out are these the children of adam that died out in the flood or are these the children of Adam that survived the flood? Are they children of Noah? Uh, all of these are the bottlenecks for young earth creationists. And um, <coughs> our exactly. authors are not exactly at, to go here's into this. The thing. You, can look at a, you can look at the skull or the chunks of skull that we have for fluorescences. And the assembled skull looks, looks very little like, it, like, like, uh, like an example of sapiens. If I was, if I had to, if I, if, if pushed, I would suggest that they are not, in fact, based on, they would, they would be uh, based on erectus, not, uh, not. Oh, yeah, and, and the, 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 the cladistic studies of which there are now quite a few and a lot more data, that's why all the work prior to 2009 you put is 
on the siding because they only have one specimen to look at. You don't make rigorous analysis based upon one fragmentary specimen. You need more data and more has accumulated since then. And uh, now that they've got a much larger data set, not big enough to resolve some of these questions and the scientists will continue to work on it. Uh, nope. Whatever it is, I think it's gonna be fascinating. The, there are, what was- or Did I hear that we actually had enough, enough fragments from various places uh, from various dig sites, we could actually assemble uh, a pair of adult skeletons. Mm, no, not that. Uh, not, as far as I can see, not nearly that much. It's very, very fragmentary. They've got, I think, some uh, postcranial stuff, and that's another issue. Is some of the data from that is fascinating because it's it's not merely like Homo erectus. Some of them have features that are pre-Homo erectus that even suggest Australopithecines or Homo habilis. And so what we've got is a hint that either you're looking at developmental processes that can tweak that, that erectine anatomy in interesting ways, that's one option. The other is that you've got some missing critters in the mix of the spread of African hominids out of Africa that we aren't catching yet in the um, uh, data field so far. And uh, my suspicion is more towards the idea that this is variations on Homo erectus, because look at the, the morphological difference between erectus and Neanderthals and us, uh, that you've got a lot of different plays around it. But all of that goes back to that allometry, that when you have the, the basic same bone systems, different ways of tweaking them produce different effects. And we now know that, that Neanderthal, for example, now that we got way more skeletons to look at and their genetics, we can now see much more about how their growth patterns are distinctively not quite human. And there's growing information, even from the, the less fragmentary fossils that we've been able to find, but not full body fossils, is that there's enough information on there that it's falling into that erectus grouping, not homo sapiens. And so. there it goes, but it's an ongoing subject. And I can guarantee you that the people to figure this out won't be creationists. Wait. <laughs> So RJ, how, would, how, how would that even how would that even be possible at this point? Yeah. Well, I, because I'm having well, a hard time wrapping no, my head around that. No creationist does work in the field. That would sort of limit them right off yeah. the bat because uh, there's uh, you've only got a handful of creationist and anti-evolutionist paleontologists. You got Beckley, who's an insect guy over an intelligent design. Uh, not not that he's an insect. He just studies insects as his area of expertise. And then you've got Kurt Wise and Marcus Ross. They're kind of more in the dinosaur area, but they don't really do paleontology. They don't even do it much, even in the course of teaching at Creationist College. They basically write apologetics. So they're not active in the field. Uh, uh, and as far as I know, uh, you know uh, 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 I'll get to you, just uh, uh, you can comment on this. As far as I know, no creationist who dabbles in paleontology is paying the slightest attention to anything involving human evolution. Jump in. Well, that, uh, that was what I was going to say. I would argue you can't be an anthropologist and be a young earth creationist because yeah. any field you look at, whether it's biological anthropology, cultural anthropology, even linguistic anthropology, you can't look at any aspect of that from a young earth creationist viewpoint. Yeah. It, it doesn't work out at all. You have to smash data or ignore it. Yeah, Completely. and and you'll be seen doing it on a, in a blatant way, uh, and that's why you tend to see things at arm's length. Uh, you, Jackson and I have read these uh, various uh, barominology things uh, that have been done by Wood and all that, where he, he bumps into uh, uh, the Australopithecines and that a little bit, but it's really superficial. It's just like the thing that was done on the reptile mammal transition. They're they're kind of bouncing cherry picky but not really figuring out what they think happened and not openly trying to account for all the data field. And Wait, at so that level, no. So RJ, I have a question for you. Yes, are, you are you saying that yes. these creationists and people who are young earth creationists are not entirely honest and don't pay attention to any of the data if it doesn't agree with them? I am absolutely I'll just flash a tortuga alert on them. Uh, that that and this is where uh, the source methods analysis pat back uh, is so useful because I don't have to guess at this I can measure it I can literally look at what works have been cited and what hasn't what uh, and what issues are brought up this is why I'm doing a source method analysis on Ruby and Sanford so I can see literally which source data field they can pull attention to and which ones they avoid and there's no sense whatsoever in which any paleontological subject is ever really addressed fully. 
But young Earth, uh, it, to be fair, Jackson, intelligent designers are in the same boat here. Am I getting some feedback from somewhere who's got my thing on? Okay. Uh, somebody knocking around there. Anyway, the um, uh, yeah, we've right. got you say that. the intelligent design gang doesn't, ha and the old Earth creationists too, you Ross and his bunch, but look at how little they do on human evolution issues, is that, that you've still got the same data field. Every data blip exists independent of what frame you want to put it in. Young Earth creationists are trying to accordion it into an ridiculously small frame, and they have awkward problems because they have to decide which side of the flood they put it on. Are these animals dying out in the flood and therefore already were in existence, therefore were variations on the original created kinds at Adam in Eden? Or are they post-flood and therefore their diversification post-Noah? And those are awkward problems, no way around it. Uh, well, but other, for see, here's, see, here's the fun part of that, RJ. <coughs> Regardless of which side they put it on, they're still lacking this fun thing called time. Because... We, we, we look at the way we, we look at speciation as we as we have it now and we've actually seen speciation events we've seen splits above the species level even now but they what they're not seeing is that you have a large is that this doesn't take place in a single generation or in two or in ten or so or sometimes even a hundred or a thousand you're talking about you know, very slow, you're talking about very slow rates of change that can be directly observed. Um, at least they can be if you keep records over 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 six over six over no. a longer period of time. But intelligent design and old Earth creationists don't have that limitation. Theoretically, they have all the time in the world. But their problem is another parallel one: is that they never apply speciation concepts. That, well, that even I some of them who admit. That speciation happens, they don't apply it to the data field to see well just how see, much variation can take place. Now that strikes me as completely idiotic. They have every ability to do yeah. to apply speciation in any way in, in any way in any way they see fit from the way it actually works, all the way down to well, okay, these two these two people from opposite ends of town are transitional to something else. Yeah, the, the, then, the big offenders here in intelligent design would be Michael Behe and Michael Denton. Uh, Behe theoretically accepts common descent, but you can never find any example of him saying anything was commonly descended from anything else. And Michael Denton theoretically accepts speciation without batting an eyelash. He accepts ring species. He did that in his 1985 book. But literally, his brain shuts down when it comes to applying it to anything. So if you have any any animal, by definition, you find anything in the fossil record, since we know how much variation can take place with finch beaks and ring species and all of the other things that we can see genetically and uh, with vertebrates and other ones, that by definition, any animal presupposes potential cousins that are within the range of that speciation process. And each right. one of those theoretically can have cousins. And each one of those can theoretically have cousins. And finally, you have the thing where you can see the linkages that now you have cousined your way all the way to a completely new form. And then that is nested into a completely larger form. And you know, that's why the reptile mammal transition, when you look at the blips in that, because it's such a well-documented sequence, I, I would be just gobsmacked to see any anti-evolutionist try to parse their way through that, knowing what we know about variation, and not be able to connect the dots. So they just well, don't look see, at the dots. You see, RJ, you kind of worked yourself into a corner there, because these people don't touch the reptile mammal transition because it is as well documented as it is, and there's no yeah. way around it. There just isn't. Yeah. I mean, you got to get look, brain farts on this. You know, you start and with the, you start with a big with a biggish lizard like Demetrodon, which did have that those characteristic canines, and then it all just kind of goes. It all kind of flows forward from there. Yes, I've been watching. It's Aaron so Rock. bloody you gradual, notice. even with even with the, and slow as molasses, because in case some cases the the, the spread between two taxa uh, on the scope that that uh, Woodmorap danced past were sometimes 20 million years. And, and, and so how difficult is it to get from something that's almost something else and you've got 20 million years to play with? 
lots and lots and lots of time. Little, little bitty changes all adding up until you have a population that looks nothing like the one there was 20 million years ago. Very simple. And so if God didn't want us to believe in evolution, he shouldn't have created therapsids. That was just <laughs> a big, bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> no therapsids. In Archaeopteryx, gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, which will bring us eventually to the other, which brings us conveniently, although I'm almost at my half hour thing, but we'll we'll start off with Mitchell. Um, the um, Elizabeth Mitchell, for those of you who don't know who she is, is one of the charming little point people at Answers in Genesis who writes lots and lots and lots of postings where she riffs off of the current news and anything in there that looks too evolutionary. She writes a, a little smackdown piece. No, no, no. Uh, the problem is that the information isn't what she wants it to be. And so um, one of the ones, this I stumbled into this one quite accidentally because there was a really nice uh, special on National Geographic that was done where uh, Jack Horner uh, and uh, uh, Hans Larsen, his colleague, uh, had been investigating uh, bird evolution. And he was looking at, uh, Larson was looking at it from the developmental biology. And he made a really fascinating discovery that no one had noticed before in the biology because they weren't looking really close with the right tools, uh, more accurate uh, microscopes and, and more um, fine-tuned uh, embryological studies that in chickens, uh, chickens of course don't have tails. They have a little pig style like the modern birds, but their embryos have tails and specifically detailed little teeny tiny little vertebrae, like 16, 17 of them, the whole little line of them down there in their little tail. They exist very, very early and then they disintegrate and are absorbed. And it turns out that those are in the same ballpark as what we can see going on in the tails of theropod dinosaurs. And indeed, they can, they can now track down the, the variations and what genetic components are involved in that. So I put a big link to the 2014, 2015 paper uh, that um, related to that. Well, anyway, Mitchell, I put the posting up of her. She was riffing off of this material uh, in 2010. And it was hilarious to see how she was doing this. Uh, she tried to kind of dismiss it like, well, this is not a problem for creationism. And she had the gall to link to of developmental biology paper from 1951. Why would you do that? And you can follow the link to it in her thing, you know, because it's openly available. I mean, the whole point was that they were they were the tools were much more primitive in 1951 compared to what they are today. And so, why would an old thing that was decades, 50, half a century old, that's technically older than me? Why would that be relevant when new work in the 21st century had uncovered new information not known to them? Why did she think that she could pull a stunt like that off? <laughs> I don't know. Good it question. Like she's got a leak in her brain pan somewhere. Yeah, and it's it's uh, I uh, all you have to do is to compare her account, which I put the link up to, and the actual technical paper, which is really delicious. Uh, where it goes into, into so much on the, what we figured out about how the development of birds out of uh, feathered theropods and the developmental biology aspect of which this is just a part. And, it, and there's beyond that as well, of course, the, the retroengineering of, of dinosaur teeth uh, in birds uh, that they can see. So many of these little subcomponents still lurking around in the genetic field in there. It's just, just absurd. Well, let me put my little um, Battle up here and call attention to our, our merry crew at uh, Patreon who support uh, uh, the project. Okay, we are sharing. We are sharing. Let's see. Infinite regress of Zamirs. There we go. Uh, my tip patrons, um, uh, Stephen and Dyer and Eat and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Totes Real and Everett and Paul. Thank you all. And once again, there is my website, uh, www.tortukin.wordpress.com. There's a slew of uh, postings there. There's also a www.tortukin.com where I put up uh, early draft versions of the, of the um, uh, of modules. Uh, and I'm still tinkering around trying to figure out how to make everything more friendly for people who have smartphones as opposed to PCs because reading PDFs is a pain in the ass. Uh, in that context, I will appreciate that. Anyway, uh, the patreon.com, uh, which is the one way of supporting the project, although they are slow as molasses on trickling money, and therefore I will remind people that the faster and happy route that gives RJ smiles is gofundme.com dcgo, 
where I get the stuff like Lickety Split and in the current circumstance where finances can be really tight, um, that is more than necessarily appreciated. So we will stop sharing on that little puppy and uh, um, get to um, our um, uh, recap here. Uh, do we have any comments so far? Hey, Pug, what is your opinion on this? I am, um, well, that about, that about covers it. <laughs> As for the question of as for the question of why such an old paper was used to support the argument, because the text search that was used produced that article as having the necessary words. In it. <laughs> That's, That's a possibility, although she didn't authority quote it; she just alluded to it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Mitchell does, in fact, have variants, so she probably had drawn on this as stuff that she may have already been aware of from her college work, which would have been back in the 1980s or 90s, and therefore drawing on material that's even older in the pre homeobox era. Mr. Jackson, uh, comments from you, our biology friend. Mr. Jackson has... Oh, there you are. Oh, there we go. I... Rafting platyrines. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't exactly say that I'm impressed that she was using such an old article, but I mean, it's it's just so easy to use newer material. There's literally an entire yeah search engine called Google Scholar where you can find newer material. Yeah, and in fact, you want to know the newer material, because that is relevant to what the hell is going on. That, that the, the goal is to explain all the data. It, I, I have no problem with some creationist who wants to try to argue that flood geology is real and that there are created kinds. Goody gumdrops, do it. But that means do it. You have to account for all the data, every scrap of it. You want to be actively seeking out all that information, and you need to work out what you think happened in detail, which, needless to say, creationists are going to have a tall order to do, uh, both in terms of the fossil preservation, the taphonomy, the biogeography. Uh, it's a mess, and that's why that's you never see them doing it. You see, yeah. here, you see I, have a different, I, have a, I have a different hypothesis for you. <laughs> you see, mm -hmm. folks like folks like Bethy here want to be that fish in the barrel of gin. Okay, <laughs> the one that we're going out, the, the one that everybody with the shotguns are going after. <laughs> the only thing is, she doesn't want to, she I don't, doesn't I don't, want I don't call. Like, what, what, what's your point on that one? You, remember, you, you, know, the, you know the whole thing about uh, shooting fish in a barrel. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, replace the water with gin. Yeah, and then put a, and then and then make Elizabeth the fish. Yeah, she wants to be and that fish, so she doesn't feel it. So that she doesn't feel it when she gets shot down. Well, no, Elizabeth isn't going to think she is shot down. None um, of them do. That, that's the whole point: is that she will always. Uh, since I contend she's a tortucan, maybe, as it, it's not maybe, possible I mean, to be an animal. Maybe, 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 well, croc squirrel. Yeah. Think about it this way: uh, you look at what Matt Powell has done recently. He has been. It has been explained to him repeatedly over the past few weeks how carbon dating works and, and just yeah, a few days ago to talk about carbon, just a carbon few days ago he put up a video saying that carbon dating proves the earth is billions of years old yeah which you cannot so. do because there's going to be no bloody carbon right and in fact yeah. you wouldn't I, even get I, carbon elizabeth, you wouldn't even get carbon elizabeth operates at a higher level things than that have that bear carbon 14 that far back so he's already completely out of line. You know, Although you Elizabeth don't... operates at a much higher level than a Matt Powell, methodologically they're in the same ballpark because what Matt does is he scavenges around a subject that he doesn't really think through very well, and so he, he muddles radiocarbon with radiometric and so thinks that one or the other, and so boop, he's operating down, and he thinks Kent Hovind is legitimate. So, I mean, that... that well, that, okay. Oh, let me, then, then, let me, let, let me refer, then, then let me go back to my original statement and correct it. She doesn't want to mm -hmm. feel it when she... She doesn't want to notice when she gets shot down. That's why she's... In, that's why she's busy swimming in gin. <laughs> no, well, but remember, Elizabeth uh, Mitchell is not an invisible person. She is one of the active promoters. She's not one of their lecturers, per se, uh, but she is one of their apologetic writers. And yeah. so there's a big swath 
of Mitchell's stuff that's been going on for years and years and years. She's one of their point people. She's one of their fact claimants functionally. And so uh, the fact that she has a bit of, uh, she has science credentials and the like gives her a gravitas that makes her a useful apologist in a way that some doofus like Matt Powell at the Hovind end of the spectrum uh, doesn't. Uh, but methodologically, you can spot the, the hide the ball game that's going on. And, and what I would contend is, is that th th their minds are effortless in this respect. The, they seek an apologetic argument. It's a thing that must be true. Matt's doing the same thing from his end. She's more diligent about it, so she ferrets out stuff that makes sense within her frame, and then her brain shuts off. And we're seeing the same phenomenon with Rupi and Sanford, where they have the non-negotiable position, and they're scavenging blip by blip by blip for just the pieces of things which put together in an apologetic argument will read in a way that will reinforce the thing that they already decided has to be true, because it must be. Because and that's... that's because that's the yeah. way the universe works, according to Ruby and Sandra. Uh, unfortunately, it's fascinating to watch. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can I kind of get that from the number of from the number of videos that have been done on this particular topic. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually fun. It, it, it's just fascinating to watch you to watch you wade in there, grab several mm -hmm. pieces of data, and say, "Well, okay, here we go with this bit." and they've got it completely wrong yeah. because this, and see here's why here's why it's out, especially useful the sad part of it is you can lay out their argument completely what their actual argument was from just what you're pulling out yeah and what what why it's reason is so useful and why matt powell connects up with this is because what functionally you're doing is opening up the hood on the brain and seeing what's going on inside it's not a pretty picture but it's still an accurate picture because you, we can observe that Elizabeth Mitchell thought that a very dated 1951 source could be relevant to a 21st century technical work that she does not really want to account for. Just as Matt Powell scavenged around for things that he wanted to be true, so he gloms on to um, oh, um, uh, Robert Carroll's uh, authority quote that he nicked from some unidentified creationist website that had nicked it from Henry Morris's apologetics. And it literally didn't occur to Powell to look up the original material, even though it was literally available full text online. So that <coughs> level of lack of curiosity was so glaring there. Mitchell is doing the same thing at a higher level that, that at, when you look at it as scholarly methods direction, you can spot where they're not going farther. And so the, the inability of working out the, uh, of the, the technical model at her end, Matt is getting nowhere near. Remember my four different things that creationists are always getting wrong? Uh, secondary sources, limited data field, map of time, and what would change their mind. Um, your, your secondary source addiction, that's Matt Powell. But Mitchell is operating in the limited data field and the not figuring out what they think happened model. And plus all of them have that what would change their mind difficulty. So when you get at somebody with a technical degree like, like Elizabeth Mitchell, she's operating at that higher echelon, but she's still tripping up on them. And you can see them do it. It's not a, a, a vague opinion. It's a direct observation, which now I'm getting uh, about 20 minutes left on here. Let's get to point number three on the agenda, Ooh, which is, three. oh, Michael Egner and the sinuses and testicles. Um, really? Uh, yeah. Nathan Lentz, who is a, Nathan Lentz, who is a biologist, uh, has been writing a variety of criticisms where he points out, he's an evolutionist, he's pointing out how badly designed and oddball we are, and a lot of the things that we have are strange leftovers from the happenstance of our lineage, like our external genitalia and a few other things. And um, uh, Michael Egner, who is an intelligent design uh, doctor and kind of the Dinesh D'Souza, of intelligent design. He's a, a, a truculent, uh, argumentative, smug ass. And um, <laughs> uh, 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 what else can one do to describe Igner? And, bonus, um, hey, you know what? You know what, RJ? Bonus points for for the correct use of the word truculent. <laughs> That's oh, not a word oh, I hear uh, Scratch often. has a question. Well, remember, remember, gang, keep an eye on what's going on over in the side of chat just in case things come up there. Um, old Scratch had mentioned that Bill Ludlow had debated Hovind, yes, and it was a juicy one. But anyway, 
Um, uh, uh, he also asked a question for me. I know all the original C14 would be gone, but since most rocks contain a small amount of uranium, wouldn't there still be a non-zero datable, undatable background amount of carbon-14? Uh, actually, it's a, a more intriguing matter than that. Um, uh, the, the uranium doesn't have anything to do with it. Carbon-14 is generated, and, and because Jackson and I are doing a book uh, criticizing uh, uh, Answers in Genesis' as Answers books, uh, and I'm doing the radiometric dating chapter, uh, that this is kind of fresh in my mind. Um, what you have is, is a cosmic rays pop into the atmosphere, and they slam into nitrogen-14 and turn it into carbon-14. And that becomes radioactive. And that is constantly being sucked up by uh, critters, although there is a certain preferential tendency for lighter isotopes in certain forms of photosynthesis and other things as opposed to the heavier isotopes. So there's a, a slight thing as to how that gets filtered into living animals. <coughs> but once the thing dies, it no longer is bringing in any new carbon. And so any mix of carbon-12 and carbon-14 and some stray carbon-13s that are in the mix uh, will gradually disintegrate. The carbon-14s will turn into carbon-12 at that little half-life thing, which is 5,000 years. You only have to have two half-lifes, and you're already past the age of the Earth, according to young Earth creationists. Uh, the thing is, is that when you are looking at a, a sample like diamonds, uh, where you want to use that as a calibrator. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, supposedly, but they're also really old. They're formed very early in the Earth's history. They're often billions of years old. And so a uh, diamond is just a perfect thing because there won't be any noticeable carbon-14 in there with the following provisos. Uh, the, the tester itself is a machine that becomes radioactive. So there's a certain amount of accidental background hum that will vary from one machine to another that can produce a false reading when there ain't no carbon there. The effect read nothing. That's one issue. Ideally, you want to start with completely new equipment, but what laboratory is going to come up with completely new equipment every time? That's one variable. It's a tiny variable, doesn't add much, but it adds a little. Another feature is that cosmic rays are pesky little things, and they are coursing through us as we speak. And occasionally, you can take your diamond out, and in the process of preparing it, a cosmic ray can come along and bing, make some new carbon-14 in there, turning a carbon-12 atom into a carbon-14. And uh, so those things can actually uh, produce some accidental irradiation that way, and that will be detected. Not often, so it'll be tiny, tiny, tiny. And another thing is that the air, very act of measuring the, the atoms can hit off of a carbon-13 atom and deflect accidentally as the child is making the sound, and end up reading as a carbon-14 when it's actually a carbon-13. or uh, So you can get faulty reasoning readings on things because the carbon-13 is not radioactive and doesn't decay. Um, so you've got a, a variety of ways that a little diamond can have teeny tiny little trace readings like a background hum. But what happens when you put it into the formulas? Well, because of those half-lives, it, it deteriorates down to the point that for all practical purposes, you can't really date anything past about 50 or 60,000 years because the amount of natural carbon-14 there by whatever calibrator you use is so trivial that it's just off the scopes. So what kind of dates do you get when you plug these residual values in? Well, you get 80 to 90,000 years. It's way off the map. And so that's how you can use them as a calibrator. So I hope that answers your question, Scratch. Uh, to put a little bit extra in on it. You can all, of course, you can only date organic matter uh, on this. We had to take into accommodation the fact that we've been throwing old carbon into the atmosphere because of, of, of burning carbon uh, uh, fossil fuels. So that had to be added into the things and they started realizing that and made some adjustments. <coughs> There's a bunch of little facts. Well, into the, it. Adjustments, uh, uh, the, uh, the adjustments you're talking about for taking old carbon and tossing it into the atmosphere, it's why they mark present, the, the quote, presence, when they're doing these things as 1950 and mm -hmm. not 2018, some six, some 70 years later. Or very well, Another little thing years. about your, your, your long-lived uranium and, and other elements that are that way. Technically speaking, uh, if you lived in Grand Central Station, um, um, not that anyone is allowed to do that, but the amount of uranium that occurs naturally in the granites that make up the station theoretically would be giving you a body dose radiation level that's roughly comparable to flying around a lot in an airplane. Because when you fly high up in at the atmosphere, you're getting uh, more cosmic rays up at that time. You're getting like a milliram or something like that. 
uh, per hour. And so, um, um, ironically, people who are uh, anti-nuclear activists uh, like Ralph Nader probably got more radiation flying around on planes to lecture about the dangers of nuclear radiation that he would if he lived next door to Three Mile Island. So it was one of the ironies of life. Uh, no kidding, right? Uh, anyway, yeah. the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Uh, mm -hmm. detectable, detectable natural carbon-14 is completely gone within two, at the by the end of 10 half-lives. You've got so yeah. little carbon in there, there's no point in even bothering. Yeah, which is that roughly fifty to 60,000 years uh, of value that, that pops up in there. And that's why if everything was only 6,000 years old, uh, any uh, carbon material that was still left over theoretically could be dated. And creationists try to argue that that happens. There have been occasional examples of where they tried to say that they had a radiocarbon dated a dinosaur bone. Well, what it was was a contamination <laughs> because, oh, it's easy to get contaminated. I mean, in, in, unless you're just rigorous, <laughs> tiny little strippets of DNA can rub off and that contains carbon and therefore can it potentially interfere with the thing. So uh, that all of those examples is far as I'm aware, were ones that were slipshod. And the, the diamond cases um, that they did uh, and some other stuff that they would put up as samplings were one where you were getting these 80 to 90,000 year values. Of course, it's they're, they're perfectly reasonable for today to do that. They're not dating at 6,000 years now, are they? <laughs> one, of the fun things that I've, one of the fun things that I've found when looking back at preservation techniques uh, from the 1800s all the way up through, I think it's the early part of the 20th century, was that they tended to want to lacquer bones, uh, mm. in order before they were shit before they were before yeah, they were yeah. moved. That'd be that'd be yeah, Now back to back to Egner. Uh, well, I still got some time on there. Uh, good old Michael Egner, the intelligent design guy, was uh, lighting in, at, um, and there have been quite a few posts, in fact, at um, the Discovery Institute. Um, uh, Nathan Lentz. Um, provides a bunch of links to them in the posting that I put up. And also I put up two of Michael Egner's posts where he's lambasting him about the testicle at matter and the evolution of that and on the sinuses. I have a little occasional sinus trouble myself. And so this one was particularly funny because um, the, the, the sinuses that are, there's a bunch of sinuses in the head and the ones in the bottom actually drain out the top <laughs> as their primary drainage point, and that's because of the weird evolution of life in our vertebrate lineage to where we've gotten bent around. So that's why we can get clogged up sinuses, uh, and this is would seem like a design defect. And uh, Egner was arguing, he cited a paper that related to the sinuses up above and implied that that was the same as the stuff down below. So he, uh, Lentz actually just skewered him on the fact that he was misrepresenting the source material. And either didn't understand it, or or uh, deliberately misrepresented it. I'm, I'll go for the misunderstood. Tortukans have a limitless ability just to not understand the the context of the stuff that they read, regardless of how professional they are, no matter how many PhDs they may have. That they, they they're so anxious to find the blip that they'll latch on to it, independent of trying to make sense of the data first. So anyway, Why there will be some sense of the data, RJ. Uh, they they couldn't they they couldn't Tortukanize themselves then. Well, but they, they, they want to look that way. Every, uh, if you look at a creationist like Chuck Misler or Hank Hanegraaff um, or the people at the Discovery Institute, they really want the science to be on their side. They want the, 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 the conceptual position is that there are two books. There is the revelation of God and then there's the natural world. And these can never contradict. They will be complementary. They will mesh just beautifully. And in order to get the meshing beautifully, they've got to edit one or the other severely. And the young earth creationists don't allow editing in the Bible side, so they have to flush data down the field on the other side. The ones on the old earth and intelligent design ones uh, start parsing the Bible text, and then they take still only snipes and snippets of material from the physical nature side. But in either case, they're missing huge swaths of data fields. So that's why the, the, the one that, that when any anti-evolutionist says, well, we deal with the same data that you do, we just have a different philosophical assumption, go, go bull pucky, no, that ain't true, that they're missing 90% of the data field. In no sense whatsoever can they be said to be paying attention to the same data. They only pay attention to tiny little snippets of things that can be made if you look at them just the right way um, will fit the thing. And this is the same method 
that more extremely weird groups do, uh, your moon landing hoaxers and all the rest, um, are using the same method. They just have a slightly different methodology or a, a data field. Um, and Sai, uh, you are, uh, are the master of the uh, Flat Earth uh, um, anti-brigade over at your uh, movie nights. Uh, and you, you've seen this as well, the same methodology Robert Kennedy Jr. on the anti-vaxxer side and Kent Hovind on the creationism side and uh, of Dubai on the flat earther side, they're all the same method. They just have a different set of blips they're putting in. Comment, please, side. <laughs> Indeed, I, I concur. It's, it can, can him, we start, with, we start with the same data, yes, but some of us mangle it to where it's not <laughs> recognizable anymore. I think. <laughs> Eric Hovind, he does that too. Yeah. yeah, all of them. It's one universal bad method toolkit that there's the only way to arrive at a faulty conclusion, a really bad, this is not even slightly right conclusion, is if you parse your data field and you don't think through what you think happened and you rely on secondary sources, dated secondary sources, you don't fact check a damn thing, you don't really think through what you think happened, you, you have a vague idea of what you want to have happen, but you mainly don't want something else to have happen. So your flurfers, your flat earth people, they don't really, well, they not, not really, they don't ever offer an actual model of what the flat earth is. They argue that the globe earth is wrong for reasons X, Y, and Z, and here's something I got off the internet that said so. And the same thing that Mitchell is doing in her own way, she's just <laughs> operating at a slightly higher scholarly level, but it's still data suppression. You do run, you do run into one significant problem when you argue like that, though. Just mm. because even if you did by some miracle, and I use that word, and I use that word incredibly broadly, manage to get uh manage to disprove say globe earth because we all know that will never happen we've actually seen it from the outside i uh, it still does not generate it, it still doesn't generate any evidence whatsoever for your point of view and yeah. that's where intelligent designers fall over on their faces well, all, well, all, all of, um, groups that argue uh, a negative argument, a false dichotomy, that either my stupid is correct or your supposedly stupid is correct. And therefore, if I can disprove your argument, ergo, mine must be the correct one. Well, that's true if and only if those are true actual opposites. But nothing in the data field actually supports any of that. Uh, the alternative, everybody has to make their own alternative directly. And it needs to account for all the available data set. And the you moment cannot, you start analyzing flat earthers or anti-vaxxers or moon landing hoax people or young earth creationists or the squishy intelligent design, uh, at the data point level, you start seeing them doing the telltale shuffleboard games. Oh. And it's not, not good reasoning. It's also boring. I mean... I have the only time I learn things from reading creationists is what I learn when I research the stuff they left out. <laughs> I see. Well, no. that's at least something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I, it, it's a great learning Outside opportunity. Of the dark stick in the backside. Yeah. Some creationists will come up with some cockamamie thing that I didn't know anything about, and I will then research to find out what there is about it, and I end up knowing more about the subject now, and it's genuinely grounded on information. So, yeah, it, they, they're a learning opportunity. There are quite a few um, critics of creationism that can say uh, creationism is an excellent learning opportunity. It's just not for the reasons they think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I say creationism oh, teaches you real science. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, there's well, a, there's I, a, I, I, I can sympathize that. How creationism taught me real science? Yeah, I don't remember the name of his channel, but if you could, but oh, <laughs> you Phil, for well, Google Tony Reed, Reed. you will find I'll, it. I'll put him in. Phil Tony Reed. He's uh, written several different pieces over the years, and I think all of them are available online, full text, because I was pissed off that I wasn't initially able to were behind firewalls that were in uh, technical journals and that. But yeah, Phil Center is a paleontologist, has um, uh, in his side hobbies. Uh, goes into why flood geology is a pile of dingoes kidneys, why there aren't really any stegosaurs on um, uh, um, stuff, and there are no surviving dinosaurs and all these other things. And so he goes into cryptozoology and some of these other topics, in addition to 
creationist baromenology regarding the dinosaurs. And because he's like an actual paleontologist and like knows the actual data, uh, it's like easy for him to bring up this information because he's knowing the stuff. So it's always very dangerous when somebody who's an actual expert in the field weighs in on it and has the, the wit and style to make a good apologetic argument. Um, oh, I, I just happened to watch um, uh, yesterday uh, uh, Darren Nash, uh, who I'd never actually heard before. I'd only read tons of his stuff. He's an absolutely wonderful blogger and science writer and that, and goes on a lot of, of um, uh, paleontology issues and that. But uh, he's, he's a Brit. And uh, he, uh, there was a theory that was put forward by this guy, Ford, that all dinosaurs were aquatic. And uh, this is a variety of paleontologists by amazing surprise saying, what? And so Nash <laughs> did just hilarious. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, what? Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he argues, uh, the Ford argues that tyrannosaurs are actually aquatic swimmers, like crocodiles, that their tails are oh. supposedly adapted to it. And Nash is going, no, 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 no. We have a Have right, you been looking at the feet lately? Yeah, <laughs> yeah these, are, these are terrestrial therapists. Oh, I think Brian has put up, Brian Stevens has put up Leo Electronica. Uh, one of uh, Center's piece, because I, I recognize that's one of the venues that he's done with it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, so All there's right. a lot of um, information. And remember, you can find a lot of relevant information just in my bloody bibliography, although I recommend not printing it because it's 2,500 pages long. But nonetheless, you can download that and you can search through it. Uh, it, even as, uh, as PDFs, you can do uh, text searches and that. And I'm when I'm responding to anti-evolutionists, often I can't right off the bat remember what little pile of information that I have tucked away in some stack that I have yet to process, but I can find a lot of relevant ammo just by doing a quick topic search through my bibliography or looking up who authors are or particular websites that I can track down so that I can then say, oh, really, you're making a claim. Let me drop this anvil on you. And uh, right. anybody who follows me on, on Twitter will see I do that at many opportunities when I feel the thing is appropriate. Hmm. How many of you follow? Uh, uh, we can ask uh, those in the uh, uh, peanut gallery there in the, in the live chat there as to how many of them do follow me on Twitter. If you are not on Twitter, if you are on Twitter, it, um, you can follow me there. And uh, you can see me jousting and applying source methods at every turn. Uh, with uh, people online, Jackson and Cap and uh, Caucus Squirrel and Cy and all the rest are on there. Cy, I, 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 um, I love the fact that Cy is one of those very few who will lambaste and directly criticize uh, Answers in Genesis. And I don't see anybody at the NCS <coughs> doing that. And, and Richard Dawkins and these other, they don't bother with it. But I, I contend, and I think Cy, you can tell me whether you agree as well, that if, if you see stupid online, that you are derelict in your duty if you don't say this is stupid and why. Indeed, you are morally obligated to expose stupidity where you where it is found. But, Sai, what, about, were... Sai, what about moral relativism, though? <laughs> All morals are relative, right. so it doesn't matter. All right, you have a moral obligation to expose uh, foolishness where you find it, unless it's the doorbell and your pizza is getting delivered. Then you don't have it. <laughs> then, then uh, there's then there's standards on that one. Yeah, yeah. The uh, 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 but the, the thing is, is that there are lots and lots of people out there, and the idea that you wait for some authority figure to do the job for you when you're available to do it, and you add the B in your bonnet because you study the subject matters. Everybody who's listening to my voice, I'm sure you know, I know. Uh, Cap has his design interest, and Jackson has his biological stuff, and Crocus Squirrel has a bunch of technical issues, and Psy Strike has fascinations on a lot of the physics and stuff relating to flat earthers and all of us. Everybody's got their little areas that they know well because they do them, they have expertise in them, they have natural interest in them. Nobody has to put a cattle prod to you to be interested in them, just like I am with dinosaurs, no matter what. So we can all marshal our various networks of information. And when anybody sticks their head up saying woo stuff, one of somebody in the network can, or more, ideally, can be responding. And I will get in little things like with enfilades, with Jackson and uh, what I call an enfilade. Let me put the little word up. Uh, enfilade. It's an old military term. It's where you get up firing from two different directions at the same time. And it's a handy thing you can do on Twitter or any social media 
where somebody says woo and you come in and point out oh no this is not woo and here's why and one of your associates comes in and says oh yeah i've heard that's woo uh, did you know about this and now you can have an interesting conversation going where you're talking the science evidence and now your wooists are a captive audience that are observing this exchange and if any of them want to weigh in why come on in but they don't tend to do that <coughs> wouldn't you agree of oh, uh, uh, jackson and 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 sigh that we don't get feedback even from their defenders we never get it from aig directly it, it's very rare for defenders of their position to actually defend their position they, we know there's tons following these sites yes yeah, yeah they, they don't with well, the block well, how they defend I'm, yeah, that's true. I liked uh, the one guy who said, uh, who told RJ, we're getting real tired of you, <laughs> Downer. <laughs> I like <laughs> oh, that yeah. one. Oh, and the guy, there's one, this uh, Tertius, he's a hilarious one. Um, he's a young Earth creationist who is not very detailed informed. I mean, this guy's not lobbing sources at me. So, I mean, he's not, he's not even lobbing creationist sources at me. He's just talking dribble. And he, he's, he's uh, a Trump supporter, surprise. And he's taken a playbook out of Trump because he will call people, uh, um, uh, in one case, uh, in, he would call me uh, hashtag Jimmy boy. And another one, he would say hashtag Eddie boy. And so he would use the same thing like uh, Trump did with Ted Cruz uh, insult. And I was saying, uh, is, is hashtag Eddie boy any less intimidated by this action than I am by hashtag Jimmy boy? I mean, uh, I, anybody who knows me realizes I'm not exactly easily cowed by a hashtag. <laughs> see, he can, see, I would, I would love to see him try and hashtag me. <laughs> Cause oh, I'm still a and by the way, I do have a hashtag I want to popularize, which is hashtag Tortugan alert. Mm -hmm. which is uh, an easy way of reminding people when you use it that you are flagging that person as somebody who has an ability not to think about things they don't want to think about. You are not saying they are stupid. They could be very bright. You're not saying they are politically liberal or conservative. They could be either. They, you're not saying they are religious or not. Uh, they could be atheists. They could be uh, um, uh, religionists. Uh, you're saying nothing at all about them except that they have just said something which is really wrong and that apparently they have come to that conclusion by not thinking about things they don't want to think about and that therefore you are flagging a methodological defect in their approach and so uh, uh hashtag tortukan alert is um uh, a, a, a a not yet trending thing nothing i've ever done is ever trending <laughs> with, with the state of the internet <clears throat> as it is th there is no way that should we, we have all been remiss in not using that enough that should be trending, considering the it's, amount of foolishness. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, and if anybody asks about it, if you use it and they go, what the hell does that mean? Then you have an opportunity to explain them. <laughs> and now that's a learning opportunity. See, now you guys don't, you guys don't tag me in these things very often. Well, you there, do that more. There's a lot of people, I, I tend to, um, uh, usually when I'm getting involved in various exchanges, stuff that take that Darwin and uh, take that science and stuff that where I follow, because I don't follow any of these people directly, uh, any lower echelon, any evolutionist, I, I, there's too many of them, I don't care. Uh, but I will get engaged in them because they are being brought up by take that Darwin or someone else. And there's often like 40, 50 people in the thing. There's a lot of, of taggers around in there. And it, it's, um, but I'm using them as an enfilad audience that you have a series of people, uh, all the ones that are creationists in there, uh, you're not going to persuade them that, that they're Tortugans. Tortugan alert. Uh, but there may be quite a few in there who are science defenders who maybe need to up their game. Uh, I've, I've occasionally pushed back when somebody comes up and they try to make a little more on origin of life issues than they really should, or they've, they've drawn upon some older issue that basically opens them up for a creationist to be able to do a counter argument. And I'm trying to get more and more people to bring up reptile mammal transition uh, and uh, these things that are, um, are, are just do delicious to pass up and to bring up paleogenomics and all that to try to drag as many of our side up to the 21st century stream and to get more people looking up the primary sources and reading the original material directly. Not everybody is going to warm onto that, but it's not because the information isn't available, gang. It's all handy uh, and, and easily done. So we're past our... Um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, gold scratches. It's bad when Ted Cruz has the high moral ground on you. You've got to be pretty down low for that to happen. But anyway, um, uh, we'll uh, conclude our analysis here amidst the child screaming that um, uh, the point I made about uh, Sanford and are continuing their same shtick with homo habilis and tools, uh, that their bad methodology is showing every single stage of the way. Uh, that we move on to Elizabeth Mitchell trying to deny uh, the fabulously interesting uh, information on uh, the tales of, of birds and how they contain the substrates of their ancient dinosaur lineage. Uh, and then we've got uh, Michael Egner over in Intelligent Design Land explaining uh, rather badly uh, why it is that we can have clogged sinuses. And so that's actually a, brings up medical and applied issues is that to understand how things are the way they are so we can figure out better medicines and figure out better science and understanding to make better sense of stuff plus it's damned interesting you got to have a model that's actually accurate and seeks out the data and tries to explain stuff and lays itself open for refutation and let the chips fall where they may and the one thing that really stands out about the anti-evolution worldview is they really never end up explaining anything and that's not good enough for me. Comments as we get ready to shut down here, gang. No. That's, I do. I, I, I'm not really what you would call an ignore expert. Uh, <laughs> oh, if, if you are, I would feel sorry for you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, well, don't feel, don't feel bad there. Don't feel bad, Cy. Yes. People that are really wish they weren't. Uh, yeah, Egner is an annoying fellow if you if you uh, if you could look in my bibliography and look up michael egner um, um i'll put the name up there for anybody else there and you can see all the egner pieces that i have in there and if you do a text search for his name uh, just do the egner part uh you'll find some of his various critics uh catching up in that and that will give you a sense of the scale as to how much of a little mess is going on in here. And unless you have a by nature masochistic nature, I would recommend you might not want to investigate any further on that because he's a very tendentious, annoying fellow. I don't even know that he even popped up in Slam Dunk because he's too far away from the reptile mammal transition. I know I mentioned Cornelius Hunter, but I don't know that I mentioned Egner much. Is he the one that's mildly God of the Gapsy with his, we, we don't know where, where in the where in the brain <clears throat> this particular behavior resides, therefore God? Uh, well, all of the intelligent designers are that way. We have to remember that cognitive literature across the board is virtually ignored in anti-evolutionism. Remember, I'm measuring this thing uh, uh, in TIP, and I'd like to keep at measuring it. Uh, and, and cognitive literature is barely a few percentage points of the available technical literature. It's just scattershot and no model on their end. So all the things that they can do now with fMRIs and that to work out the details of what brain systems are doing what and all of that um, uh, is uh, just not on their data field. Uh, but we know an awful lot about that now. And, and it's starting to close in on issues of consciousness. As I mentioned in other evolution hours, uh, the um, uh, Qualia problem is probably unresolvable. Uh, in the sense that you can't figure out an experiment to differentiate it. Why does red look like red? Why do we perceive color as color? You know, th th those are fundamentals. And, uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not absolutely natural and we can see uh, the nuts and bolts of a lot of things and their adaptive evolutionary uh, aspect uh, that, in fact, uh, Jackson was aware of things with um, that one guy that um, uh, you were discussing with who was making a big, big deal, Glenn, about um, the, uh, where's the adaptive evolution of shame? And um, I hadn't actually studied that in any great detail. I knew about the other aspects of uh, moral reciprocity and all of that, but the specific subject of shame hadn't popped up yeah. in my research. And yeah. I did some searching and it turns it was, out there's uh, early work on that. Yeah, it was, uh, it seemed kind of, kind of random almost i don't know that whole discussion seemed kind of like 20q though um well but. i can i can see from his young earth creationist frame why it's important because remember man is formed naked in eden adam and eve are naked as jaybirds and then uh the apple incident where they got the discovery of good and evil and suddenly oh my we're naked we feel ashamed 
this is the mythical explanation for why there's shame. And so shame for his frame is right at the very beginning, literally on like day seven or eight of the creation of the world because you know the the, uh, the the time spent in garden of eden is kind of vague it could literally have only been a few weeks so you know we're going from the created perfect thing and then the apple incident and then exiting the garden of eden in the course of a week or two theoretically um and so there's no real close time frame on it so this is a very core concept from his mythological frame and the idea that there is an adaptive evolutionary social system to feeling of revulsion and shame and frustration and angst over the opinions of your peers and how you're going to react to others. There's a whole cognitive architecture that's us. They're starting now to focus in on that actual shame feeling. And so I put up a, a paper um, on the, um, uh, the video feed to it uh, that uh, related to, a, I think, 2014 fMRI study. And it sounded like from the paper that that's one of the very earliest ones that's been done. So they're just starting on it. And then there was a thing in PNAS, I think from 2015 or 2016, that looked as a cross-cultural thing about how different cultures have dealt with shame issues and that apparently is adaptive in the way they have conflict resolutions and a lot of other stuff. So um, the, the, the thing with uh, Daniel Dennett, if you're familiar with Daniel Dennett, he, he calls uh, Darwinism the universal acid. It, it wants to look at anything that's biological and evolutionary. And it's going to be annoying to everybody that doesn't like Darwinism. So because it's never going to stop, it's going to be looking at this and looking at that and trying to figure that out and trying to figure that out. And it's going to just drive all of the anti-evolutionist bonkers. Uh, and so it's easier for them to stick with something they can manage like Piltdown or, or buzzwords like shame or something where they can put it into their little box and they don't have to worry about all that data field. <laughs> okay, well... We're 11 after the hour here. Uh, any final thoughts before I wrap her up? No, not really. Oh, boot camp. I, I, I drew oh, come on, Cy. <laughs> you got the cute little pug. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will be, if I'm having struck by lightning, uh, I'll be uh, uh, here uh, next week to continue the sagas. And uh, I try to put in, as I've been doing for the last few weeks, uh, anything that pops up in my research contemporaneously, I then will add on as little background material like we did with the sinuses and Elizabeth Mitchell. And does that sound like a, a good strategy, do you think? Sounds good to me. Most assuredly. Okay. Boy, let's have some enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and then I'll put a final... Um, a plug out there that I, I put a link up to uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. All those out there who have not got the book, two important reasons. One, it's a kick butt analysis that nobody else has ever done on the reptile mammal transition and creationism. And literally, no one's done it before. So you got the top of the heap. And secondly, the author needs the royalties. So to get by and maybe buy ink now and then and food and that other stuff that I'm rather fond of like surviving because I am trying to do this. And then I've also got a novel of uh, the Paralogues of Phileas Fogg. So if you want to have an escape from our tense 21st century, go back to the tense 1870s and uh, read my uh, story, my retake of Phileas Fogg. Also, our author needs the royalties, but it's a good read. So it though, that will end. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hmm? <laughs> it was, I just wanted to add, it was interesting that and I, I hope you weren't going in order of importance because then you put ink above food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, for me, yes. That that for my my work in tip is so important. I can go along and go. Oh, I haven't eaten in a while. Well, I I will have a thing of spaghetti later on. That should do. But mm. the, but but the information flow. Tip is a big project. I've bitten off a lot of stuff on this on a topic nobody has ever done before. If you, uh, I think everybody from Pologia to Jackson and others that have bumped into me have found out that I'm going into areas that hasn't really been covered before and in the way that's been covered before. Would that be a fair statement to say? Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm at the moment yes. doing it by myself. And um, uh, I have a printer, but I have to ration my printing because I can't afford ink at a regular basis. Everybody that buys ink knows it's not cheap. 
And uh, ideally, what I would love to do is the incoming technical literature, I would print up the first page of an abstract or a first page of a PDF, and then it would be physical. Then I would have that and I put the information into my bibliography and figure out what sections of the work that it goes to. And then I sort that out. I have vast fire hazards paper down in the basement where I do stuff. And then as I work on projects, I then sort through that material, culling stuff out, which is what I did in the reptile mammal transition case pulling all that data field together. Well, I can't do the printout thing regularly. I have literally thousands of pages over the last few years where I have to put them in temporary files in a pending section where I've got the main reference into the bibliography and my memory or maybe a handwritten note about what it's referring to, but the actual stuff is buried in this stuff that I can't print up because I can't, I, I have to plow through so much printing stuff for that. I can't afford it. So um, it's a thing where the more people that could help at the moment, I think there, there must be more than 169 people on the planet who think my work is a good idea because that's how many people have supported GoFundMe. And uh, that's not even as many people as I have following me on Twitter. What's wrong with this picture? Put it into perspective that Kent Hovin and Ken Ham and Ray Comfort and Michael Egner and all the other gang that operate in the anti-evolution world have thousands of followers and Kent Hovin uh, manages to start up a new little gig down there in wherever he is. And Ken Ham pulls down close to $200,000 a year at Answers in Genesis. Uh, maybe our side could help more for people who like that's trying to do work that nobody else has ever done before. You can read Nick Matsky, who did support tip. He gave some actual scratch to it. Uh, he got a description there of Panda's Thumb where I was just getting the thing started and it hasn't caused a stampede of help, but nonetheless, it's still true. So anyway, there's my plaintive cry for support uh, and uh, we'll uh, see you all next week. We are stopping the broadcast.